Welcome to the fifth session in our series on Rome Republic to Empire. Today I want to talk about the decay into violence. What I've covered so far, and let me recapitulate, what I've done so far is to explain as well as I can in the time available how it was that a central Italian city-state managed to expand until it became the dominant power first in the Western Mediterranean and then throughout the Mediterranean as a whole. I've discussed how the great wars with Carthage brought about a fundamental change in the balance of the Roman constitution because of its economic effects. I've looked at the living conditions of Romans, both rich and poor. I've also spent some time looking at the institution of slavery, which is not directly part of our subject, but it is in itself an important subject. And as I said at the end of last week's sessions, it does help to explain the great brutality of Roman political life. If you are brought up in a household surrounded by human beings who are your absolute property, you can behave towards those people with a great deal more violence and casual indifference to human suffering than if you live in a society where everybody is at least in principle free. And once you grow used to treating some human beings very badly, you will naturally extend this treatment of your slaves to the treatment of your political opponents and to your treatment of those people who are beneath you in the social scale, especially when those people have been reduced to something like dirt poverty. Now this week I want to start on the series of crises that led to the collapse of the Roman Republic. And I will start with these two young men, the Gracchus brothers. This is not an ancient statue of them. There are no ancient statues that have survived. There are a few representations. This is a statue created by a man called Eugène Guillaume, a French sculptor of the 19th century, it is for the mausoleum of the Gracchi, and it was unveiled in 1853. There is no particular reason to suppose that they looked exactly like this, but they probably looked something like this. It's the best image I can find. It is the only image I can find of the two brothers standing together. These are the two men who tried to save the Roman Republic. Their failure is what led in the next century to the great series of overpowering crises, the civil war between Marius and Sulla, the attempted revolution of Catiline, the civil war between Pompey and Caesar, the assassination of Caesar, and finally the emergence of Augustus. And the emergence of Augustus did not mean that these men had totally failed because part of what they wanted was incorporated into the Augustan settlement. But in the sense that they wanted to press a reset button in Italy and to turn back the Republic to what it had been, or what everybody believed it had been before the Second Punic War, then they were failures. But let us talk about the nature of their failure. This is where we've reached so far. By about 120 BC, Rome has these problems. You have this vast enrichment of the possessing classes, and this enrichment comes from a number of sources. You have their increasing possession of the land in Italy. In the first instance, they acquired large amounts of land after the Second Punic War, after the Hannibal invasion, by a series of 
soft leases from the Roman state. You could call them corrupt leases, but as I keep on emphasising, when the land was granted on these very easy terms by the Roman state, the land itself was probably worth no more than the contracted rents. It was absolutely ruined as agricultural land, and it was largely depopulated. Its yield must have been very low, and that was reflected in the initial rents. However, with the recovery of Italy, the idea had originally been that these lands would be granted out on leases, which could be resumed by the Roman state on payment of the war debts. But after a few generations, the leaseholders did not want the ending of those leases. They didn't want the repayment of the war debts. Possession of the land was a great deal more valuable than repayment of whatever their grandfathers had lent to the Roman state. This is the first part of the enrichment of these people. And then, once they had acquired a certain critical mass of the land in Italy, they began to kick out their neighbours. They began to drive out their neighbours in various ways and to add a large number of the smaller estates to their own already very large estates. You have the enrichment of these people by their engrossment, you can call it, of much of the land in Italy. You then have the loot and the regular tribute of this large and growing empire. The war indemnities extracted from defeated empires in the east the direct plunder from wars of conquest. This was, in principle, the property of the Roman state, but large amounts of it stuck to the fingers of the people who had taken it and whose job it was to administer it on behalf of the Roman people. Then, if you look at the bottom of society, you have the destruction of the landed freeholder class, these people often ended up in cities like Rome. Indeed, they ended up chiefly in Rome. And Rome swelled from a rather small ancient city of about 50,000 people to an immense conurbation of about half a million people. Most of those people lived in extreme poverty and they were kept alive by various official and semi-official handouts, and from the charity, and you can put charity in quotation marks, of the rich. There are some representations of the Roman upper class in the late Republic. You'll probably agree that these were not very pleasant men. However, they were men of considerable intellectual honesty, and you can see that in these representations. These are images commissioned by the men whom they represent. These men seem to have been under no delusions about their own personal beauty. They told the artists, portray me as I am, as Cromwell said, warts and all, or I won't give you a shilling. These men understood exactly what kind of people they were, rather tough-minded men, and although they treated the Roman people rather badly, and although they treated the people of Italy in general very badly indeed, you can understand how with a ruling class made up of men who looked like this, the Roman Republic in its external dealings remained highly successful and its empire continued to swell year after year. These are not the kind of men you would like to be your absolute masters. At the same time, they had enough public spirit to make sure that the external face of the Roman Empire remained highly successful. But coming back to the balance of the constitution, City politics have been converted from a set of political debates over the running of the city. Things like who is going to clean out the drains? How about building a new public library? What are we going to do about the roads? 
city politics changed from questions of that nature to competitions for office because if you served your year as a consul or a praetor or certain other functions in the Roman Republic, at the end of your period you were assigned a territory within the empire to govern for a period of one or five or whatever years and you could take yourself out to those places and grow very rich indeed. You would then come back and you would further the corruption of the city because you now had the money to put up to make sure that your son or your younger brother was able to stand for office and to win office and then himself to go out and become very rich. Most people appear to have agreed that something had gone wrong with the constitutional arrangements of the Republic. And the question in Roman politics among those people who thought about the public good was what to do about this. And the Romans were not fools when it came to thinking about politics. There were really two classes of solution to this agreed problem. The first was to try to treat the symptoms. And so law after law was made to limit corruption. Attempts were made to outlaw corruption. And so those people who bought votes could be prosecuted and barred from holding office. People who took large bribes while governing the provinces could be prosecuted in Rome and they could be fined and exiled if found guilty. So you can make a series of laws which treat the symptoms of this problem or you can look at the other side of the debate which is to take a much more radical view of the problem to accept that so long as the society of Rome and Italy remained as it was corruption and the general misbehaviour of the ruling class would be completely inescapable and that the answer was not to make occasional partial laws that tried to suppress the worst of the symptoms. The answer was to deal with the root cause and the root cause was the engrossment by the Roman governing class of the land of Italy. And this brings us... Before I move, however, to solutions, let's have a look at the state of Italy. I've said that by about 300 BC, Rome was the hegemonic power in Italy. And I said a few weeks ago, this does not mean that Italy was any kind of unified country with a capital in Rome. It was a patchwork of alliances of various kinds and of direct domination by the Roman Republic over certain regions. And what this meant was that some people in Italy had full Roman citizenship, but other people did not have Roman citizenship. Some people had a semi-Roman citizenship. They had many of the rights of Roman citizens, but they had no right to vote in the assembly or in elections for the magistrates of the Republic. And some people, perhaps a majority, had nothing approaching Roman citizenship. They were citizens of Sybaris, for example, in the south. They were citizens of Tarentum. They were citizens of the various places which the Roman Republic dominated. The people of Italy as a whole paid taxes of various kinds to support the activities of the Roman Republic. Most Italians south of the River Po were liable to various kinds of compulsory military service, but most of these people had no right to participate in the election of their generals and they had no right to help to decide whether there should be wars or peace. So they had the duty to serve the Roman Republic but they had no right to decide what the Roman Republic did. 
until about 300 BC, Latin was a minority language in Italy. The main languages were Etruscan and Greek, Etruscan in the north, Greek in the south. But with the continuing domination of Rome, there was a natural spread of Latin throughout Italy. It was the language of the dominant power in the peninsula, which meant that anybody who wanted to have any kind of status, as far as the Romans were concerned, needed to speak Latin. You have the growth of bilingual societies. You speak Etruscan at home and with your friends, but for all public business you use Latin. And this was a fairly unstable situation insofar as increasing numbers of people gave up on their native languages and became native speakers of Latin. So by about 120 BC, Italy, northern Italy at least, because Greek persisted in the south, and there are still villages in the south of Italy where Greek is spoken, but the main situation in Italy by about 120 BC was that most people spoke Latin, most people looked like Romans, most people dressed like Romans, most people, so far as outsiders were concerned, were Romans, but there was no general extension of Roman citizenship to all the people of Italy. This led to rising demands throughout Italy for the universal grant of Roman citizenship, and this contributes to the political instability of the Republic itself. But let us now turn, oh sorry, we still can't turn, and here are some maps showing the continued success of the Roman Republic. In 146 BC, on the top left part of the slide, you have those areas which are directly ruled from Rome. And I do emphasize directly ruled because many other parts of that map, the white areas, are indirectly controlled by the Roman Republic. Just as in the 19th century, South America was not officially part of the British Empire, but the activities of British banks and companies and other organizations in general made countries like Argentina effectively parts of the empire. If you are sufficiently powerful, you do not need to conquer countries in order to have a controlling influence over the internal and external policies of those countries. So the blue areas on the top left slide are a minimal position. These are the areas directly controlled by the Roman Republic, but quite a lot of the rest is indirectly controlled. By about 120 BC, the areas of direct rule have expanded. They now include a great part of Asia Minor, or the territory of modern Turkey, and most of Spain. And you can see that the area of direct Roman rule is spreading along the coast of North Africa towards Egypt. So we mustn't forget that in spite of political instability and vast political corruption in Rome and despite tensions within Italy, the Roman Republic in its external dealings continues to be highly successful. But let's now come to the proposals for reform. These didn't come out of nothing. It is not the case that one day, in 133, a young man stood up and said, I'm going to sort out all the problems the Republic faces. Follow me. Oh, something like that happened. But his proposals for reform did not emerge from a vacuum. These were proposals that had been discussed on and off for quite a long time, ever since the emergence of the problem. But in 133 BC, this young man, portrayed on the right, though again I'll say we don't know if he looked like that, but it's the best representation I can find, it's the most convenient representation, 
This young man, Tiberius Gracchus, a man of mixed patrician and plebeian ancestry, the elder son of a very rich family, one of the leading families in Rome, a war hero no less, he got himself elected as one of the ten tribunes for that year, and he announced a very ambitious programme of reform. Remember that the debate over reforming the Republic veered between two extremes. On the one side, you had those people who said, all we need is a few more laws against corruption or stricter enforcement of the existing laws against corruption. On the other side, you had those people saying, this is treating the symptoms, not the causes. We need to address the causes of what has gone wrong. Gracchus leaned towards the radical reforming wing of this debate. Because he had been elected one of the tribunes, his person was sacrosanct, and he had the right to veto any measures of any other branch in the Roman constitution. He could veto laws passed by the assembly. He could veto resolutions of the senate. He could nullify decisions of the consuls or any other magistrate. He was a man of immense negative power in the Republic, and he was also a man of some positive power so far as he could, as a tribune, put laws before the assembly. His program of reform was to revive the small freeholder class in Italy, an objective that most people in the abstract would have approved. He wanted to reduce the poor population of Rome. He would do so by getting these people back onto the land in Italy, and those who could not easily be decanted onto the land of Italy would be packed off to the new Roman colonies being established in various coastal districts around the western Mediterranean. If you increase or if you revive the small freeholder class in Italy, this will immediately increase the number of eligible recruits for the army. And although nobody at the time had any particular worries about the number of slaves on the land, slavery was not a controversial issue, his reforms would incidentally decrease the number of slaves working on the land. If you can reduce the number and the size of those great estates, more of the land in Italy would be worked by the owners of the land, and although slavery would not disappear, you would see a great reduction in those vast numbers of slaves working in chain gangs day after day. So, with the support of both consuls, this is not a revolution from below. It's not a sudden eruption of popular discontent, this is an argument within the Roman governing class, and Gracchus had the support in 133 BC of both consuls, and Gracchus introduced a land bill that would try to sort out the land situation in Italy. All leases, all of those leases granted by the Roman state to the war creditors would be converted into freeholds, but the maximum size of a freehold would be 330 acres plus 165 acres for each sum that the leaseholder could produce. Some of these estates were a million acres, more than a million acres. So everything above 330 acres that somebody had would be resumed by the Roman state. The leases would be cancelled, the lands would be resumed, and then this land would be redistributed to the landless poor. Gracchus created a land commission to oversee these reforms to land ownership. This would be headed by himself, his brother, and his father-in-law. 
which sounds, by our lights, a rather corrupt arrangement, but that was something which was in the land bill and it was generally acceptable. It looked as if this land bill would pass without serious controversy. Obviously those people who would lose most of their land were opposed, but these were a minority even of the governing class in Rome. As I said, Gracchus introduced his land bill with the support of both consuls and with a solid block of support from within the Roman governing class. But there were problems, and the problem is best explained by looking once again at this diagrammatic representation of the Roman constitution. The assembly of the people, the assembly of all Roman citizens, is the sovereign body of the Roman Republic. In principle, all laws are introduced to the assembly and voted on by the Roman people. In practice, however, in practice based on long usage, the assembly itself didn't take a very active part in the passing of new laws. Laws were debated in the Senate. The Senate itself had no law-making authority, but the Senate did have the right to suggest laws to the Assembly. And by long tradition, laws were made by introducing bills into the Senate in the first instance. These were approved or rejected or revised by the Senate, and those bills which survived scrutiny in the Senate were then passed to the Assembly with a recommendation. In constitutional theory, you could introduce a law directly before the Assembly, but in practice it was a breach of custom to do this. And what Gracchus did, he was in a hurry, he didn't want his very radical land bill to be pulled to pieces in the Senate and for the bill to be buried or for a severely watered-down version to be passed to the Assembly. No, Gracchus introduced his land bill directly before the Assembly. This meant that many senators, many members of the Roman governing class, who were friendly in principle to the idea even a very radical land reform, felt slighted. They felt as though they had been bypassed. This was, by long custom, a matter for the Senate to decide, and the Senate's decision would then be passed down to the Assembly for ratification. Instead, Gracchus has bypassed the Senate and introduced his very radical land bill directly before the Assembly. In the first instance, the bill failed. It failed at its first hurdle, because another of the tribunes, remember there were ten of these elected every year, another of the tribunes, a man called Marcus Octavius, vetoed the land bill. Any tribune could veto any act of any other institution in the Roman Republic. This included laws passed by the Assembly. And Marcus Octavius, in his capacity as a tribune, stood up and said, I do not believe this bill is in the interest of the Roman people, therefore I veto it. Tiberius Gracchus then introduced another bill before the Assembly, and this was a great deal more radical because, well, this is how revolutions happen. They start with rather moderate proposals for reform. Many people think them very radical, but they are, by comparison with, with what comes after, very moderate. The moderate bill, which would have given the leaseholders some of the land, indeed 330 acres is quite a lot of land when you think about it, this would have left the owners of those leases, this would have left the possessors of those leasehold titles with some of their land, indeed quite a nice 
portion of their land, but once that bill had been vetoed, Gracchus, Tiberius Gracchus introduced a second bill before the assembly that no longer gave that 330 plus 165 acres to the leaseholders. It simply instructed the leaseholders to vacate the land, which was thereby resumed by the Roman state. Marcus Octavius once again said, I don't like this, I will veto this one as well. And Tiberius now took the very radical and unprecedented step of impeaching his fellow tribune before the assembly. A tribune is sacrosanct, a tribune is not subject to criminal or civil proceedings during his time in office, but a tribune can still be impeached before the assembly declared unfit for office and deprived of office. So that dealt with the problem of another tribune's veto. The bill passed through the assembly by a large majority, but let's go back and look at this map of the Roman constitution. The Senate manages the treasury. In order to put this land law into effect, it's necessary to have funding for it. And the Senate now refuses to grant funds for the implementation of the new land law. The Assembly is able to make whatever law it likes, but if the Senate doesn't approve of what the Assembly has done, the Senate can refuse any funds to bring the law into effect. So the land law cannot be thrown out by the Senate, but the Senate can effectively nullify the new law by refusing to provide the necessary funds to put it into effect. You have a constitutional crisis. This drags on for a year, and the idea is that Tiberius Gracchus will serve out his year as a tribune. He will then be replaced by other tribunes, and this whole matter can be allowed to die. But then Tiberius Gracchus, and I keep mentioning his full name, or at least this part of his name, because he does have a brother who comes in later on. Tiberius Gracchus then doesn't break the law. There is no law that says a tribune can only serve one term. There's no law that says a man can be a tribune once. At the end of his term, he does not stand again for election. But it is a breach of custom. It is quasi-legal, you might say. Tiberius stands again for the tribunate, and he is re-elected. There is going to be a second year of argument over land reform. The Senate so far has blocked implementation of the bill by refusing to grant the necessary funds, but in 133 BC, King Attalus of Pergamon, one of the Roman satellite rulers in the east, dies, and because he wants to make sure that his people are not ill-treated by the Romans, he leaves his entire kingdom to Rome, on the condition that his people received just treatment. So there is a large increase in the territory of the Roman Empire, or of the empire governed by the Roman Republic, and there is also the sudden inflow of taxes, or of tribute money, from the new territories. At this point, Tiberius Gracchus steps forward and says, I vote that rather than letting this money go into the treasury, which is managed by the Senate, it should be directly applied to funding the implementation of the land law. So again, Tiberius has bypassed the Senate. He's got his land law put into law. He's got his land law passed by putting it directly before the assembly. He's now bypassing the Senate by making sure that the additional tax money coming in from the new eastern provinces 
will be directly applied to implementing the land law. He then proposes further reforms, and I'll repeat that revolutions often begin with some very moderate demands, and most people are willing, at least in principle, to accept the justice of these reforms. But then, as the debate over the reforms polarises, the proposals for reform will tend to grow more and more radical. Tiberius proposes further reforms, and they seem rather technical. The first is to reduce the period of military service that had been from 17 to 46. Also, he tries to give the people the right to appeal jury verdicts, and juries were often made up of senators, so he's democratising the justice system. And he also adds an equal number of common people to the number of senators serving on juries. So this is an attempt to grab the entire criminal and civil justice system out of the control of the senators, out of the control of the governing class, and to give it to the people as a whole. And this raises alarm throughout the entire governing class, as I said at the beginning, the governing class seems to have been fairly evenly divided. Those willing to accept this reform to land ownership in Italy and those opposed to it. After two years of increasingly inflammatory rhetoric and of increasingly radical proposals for reform, much of the governing class is now seriously alarmed and inclined to wish that the whole matter could be shut down. Resistance turned violent suddenly. The Pontifex Maximus, the head priest of the Roman state religion, indeed the title of Pontifex Maximus is still held by the Pope, isn't it? It is a position that Julius Caesar took on, and it became one of the powers held by the Roman emperors. When the empire converted to Christianity, or when Christianity was made the established faith of the empire, Constantine the Great granted the title of Pontifex Maximus to the Bishop of Rome, by whom it has been held ever since. But in 133 BC, the title of Pontifex Maximus was held by a man called Scipio Nasica. He stood up in the Senate and he incited the more radically opposed senators to violence. What they did was they smashed up the furniture in the Senate House, equipped themselves with clubs and went outside into the Forum and they attacked the supporters of reform. There were continual demonstrations outside the Senate House while these debates were taking place. The more conservative senators took up weapons, went outside, and they beat 300 people to death in the Forum. These men, these senators, had all military experience, so they knew exactly what they were doing. They went outside in a compact military formation and began clubbing the demonstrators to death. And this was a breach of all convention. When the Republic was set up is not something we can say for certain, but the Romans themselves said it was in 509 BC. For about 400 years... The Republic has maintained civil peace. No one has died inside Rome as a result of a political dispute. And suddenly this run of civil peace is broken. Suddenly the convention against political violence is brought to an end. And this had a tremendous effect on public opinion within the Republic. 
Back in 2019, and it does seem a very long time ago now after all the events of the past few years, but back in 2019, there was a stalemate within the British political system. The people, a majority of the people, it doesn't matter what size of majority, but a majority of the British people voted to leave the European Union. This was considered to be a most unwise move by a substantial number of people within the governing class and various attempts were made to prevent the referendum result from being carried into law. This led to a situation in 2019 where a majority in the House of Commons kept voting against all normal convention to force the government to seek an extension of the time before our membership of the European Union would lapse. And debates within Parliament and outside Parliament in 2019 were loud and often very bitter. But imagine if in the course of one of these debates, various members of Parliament had smashed up the furniture in the House of Commons, gone out into Parliament Square and began attacking demonstrators. That would cause the most tremendous shock in this country because such things do not happen. In foreign countries, civil violence is a fact of life. And even in our closest neighbour, in France, quite often ministers are attacked. They're dragged out of their cars and beaten with an inch of their life. And there are almost continual violent demonstrations in Paris and other French cities. We don't do that sort of thing in this country, but let's imagine that if in 2019 debates over continued membership of the European Union had boiled over into this kind of political violence, and you have some idea of the shock caused by this event. The senators finished beating to death 300 demonstrators in the forum. They then went back into the Senate House and passed a series of resolutions. These resolutions included the banishment and execution of some of the leading members of the Reform Party. One of the victims was Tiberius Gracchus himself. He died in the massacre in the Forum, and his body was thrown into the Tiber. As soon as political tensions lessened, as soon as people realised the full horror of what had happened, there was an attempt at a compromise. The Senate did vote funds to finance the Land Commission, and the Gracchan law was put into effect, but it operated very slowly, and it was never brought fully into effect. But some attempt was made at a compromise, whereby the law was now funded, the Land Commission was set up, and there was some redistribution of land within Italy. And there things rested for the next 10 years. Then in 123 BC, Gaius Gracchus, the younger brother of Tiberius, got himself elected tribune. We're now 10 years on from the beginning of this revolution. Opinions have polarised and demands for reform have become much more radical. Gaius constructs a new and much larger coalition for reform, it's no longer a matter of resuming those leases on the public lands and redistributing the land to the poor of Rome. That is part of the proposals for reform, that is the core of the proposals for reform. But there are other proposals for reform which involve a complete overhaul of the criminal justice system. It means things like supplying soldiers with clothing at state expense. It means founding a whole chain of Roman colonies on more or less empty land throughout the Western Mediterranean. It means 
a road building program within Italy. It means providing grain for the poor at a low price. I will come to that a little later. It also means giving Roman citizenship to all free inhabitants of Italy. Everything else passes through the assembly without difficulty, but the proposal to extend citizenship that doubtless seemed a tidying up exercise when it was proposed. As I said, there were many people in Italy who were indistinguishable from other Romans. They spoke Latin, they dressed like Romans, they were regarded as Romans by Greeks in the East and by barbarians in the West. They were indistinguishable from Romans, so why not give them Roman citizenship? It would consolidate peace within Italy. But of course, this is the wedge that the opponents of reform can use to break up the reform coalition. The Roman people, the ordinary Roman people, already had very limited political influence. The moment the number of eligible voters in the Roman Assembly expands to include all the free people of Italy, it means that the political influence, such as it was, of ordinary Roman people would be at an end. The possessing classes used this. They went around giving speeches in Rome. If you allow these laws to pass, Whatever influence you presently have will be at an absolute end. You will always be outvoted by people whom you must regard as foreigners. These are the descendants of the people whom our ancestors conquered. We are now allowing these people to have a decisive influence in Roman politics. This is not something that we the governing elite welcome, and it's something that you, the ordinary people of the city, should not welcome. Don't listen to these radicals. They may talk as if they're on your side, but their real agenda is your total dispossession in ways that we have never even considered. And so the Reform Coalition falls apart. In 121 BC, Gaius Gracchus was denied a third term as tribune because of a rigged election. Then in the troubles that followed this, one of the consuls, a man called Lucius Opimius, there is an image of him on one of the Republican coins on the right hand of the slide. Lucius Opimius hires a band of archers marches into the forum and begins firing off volley after volley of arrows at the followers of Gaius Gracchus. This is followed by pitched battles in the streets of Rome and what amounts to a small-scale civil war within the city. In the resulting chaos, Gaius dies. We're not entirely sure how he died. One story is that he committed suicide. Whatever the case, the Senate voted that whoever brought the man's head into the Senate House would receive its weight in gold. So the head of Gaius was retrieved from wherever it was. The brains were scooped out. The cavity was filled with lead and it was delivered to the Senate, which paid out the contracted sum of gold without question. The consul Opimius then established an emergency tribunal, a tribunal of dubious legality, but it was backed by the full power of the Senate. He established a tribunal which condemned to death about 3,000 people accused of being supporters of Gracchus, the land distribution that followed the death of Tiberius Gracchus was now discontinued. The land commission was shut down. And that is the end of any attempt at constitutional reform by peaceful means. The convention against political violence in Rome has been brought to an end. 
And Epimius, one of the consuls for the year, has established the principle that in an emergency, the Senate can take supreme emergency powers and rule by decree. And this is a precedent which was used a lot in the next hundred years. So that is the end of the first attempts at reform. It is the end of what was perhaps the best, or at least the most promising, attempts at reform. If only Tiberius Gracchus had been willing to let his bill be debated in the Senate before it was passed down to the Assembly, probably something would have got through. His land commission would have been funded. Some redistribution of the land in Italy would have followed from that. And then once some land has been redistributed, the voting power, the political power within the Roman constitutional system would have turned slightly in the favour of ordinary people and further reforms might have followed in due course. The problem for the Gracchus brothers was that they wanted immediate reform. They wanted immediate results. And this led to the death of both brothers. It also led to the death of the rigid convention in Roman political life that political disputes should not, under any circumstances, be allowed to bubble over into violence, as had been repeatedly the case in the Greek city-states. What I'd like to emphasise is that this was no kind of attempted communist revolution. Here's a picture in the right of a young man who called himself Gracchus Baboeuf, one of the French revolutionaries. He took the name of Gracchus because he saw himself as a radical. Indeed, he wanted to abolish the private ownership of land. And he said in the 1790s, society must be made to operate in such a way that it eradicates once and for all the desire of a man to become richer or wiser or more powerful than others. He's regarded as a proto-communist, as one of the forerunners of, and perhaps one of the influences on, Karl Marx and the communist revolutionary movements of the 19th and 20th centuries. He saw himself as standing in the tradition of the Gracchus brothers. However, if you look at the attempted Gracchan reforms in themselves, you can see that there is no attempt at establishing the universal brotherhood of man. There is no attempt at a communist reformulation of the Roman constitution. All the Gracchus brothers tried to achieve was a rebalancing of the Roman constitution, and this would best be achieved by resuming those leases on the public lands and then redistributing the land thereby possessed by the Roman state to the Roman poor. There were no proposals to give independence to the provincials, no proposals to give any kind of political representation to the provincials, and there was certainly no proposal to free all the slaves. None of the things that a man like Gracchus Baboeuf would have considered the minimal demands of a revolution were even considered by the Gracchus brothers or by any of their supporters. The idea was simply to make sure that the conquered territories of the Roman Republic, all those territories in the western and eastern Mediterranean, would continue paying their established tributes, but more of the tribute money would flow into pockets at the bottom of society, and that those at the bottom of society would have a stake in the well-being of the Roman Republic. This was an argument over what would most likely promote the benefit of the Roman people. 
there was no concept of universal human rights. So this, as I said, was no kind of attempted communist revolution. It was simply an attempt at rebalancing the Roman Republic. The outcome of these attempted reforms and their failure is that from now on there will be two parties in Rome. The populares, these were people who wanted to revive and later on to extend the reforms of the Gracchus brothers, and then the optimates, the possessing classes, who wanted to uphold their established privileges, and they were absolutely opposed to any changes in the land ownership patterns of Italy. We must not believe that the popular party was any kind of autonomous movement of the poor. The popular party, from beginning to end, was led by men from the possessing classes. They were led by members of the old aristocracy of the Roman Republic. Men like Julius Caesar, for example. So this is an argument within the Roman governing class, but it is an argument that divides politics. Oh, and again, the optimates, they always were able to count on widespread popular support. How they managed that is another matter, but this is not a vertical debate in Roman life. It's not a dispute between the rich and poor. It is a dispute between two parties which were fairly evenly matched and which were each led by members of the old governing elite. But what it means is that from now on there is no more of the ancient convention against political violence and Rome is now permanently on the edge of civil war. The purges and the selective murders that finished off the Gracchus brothers and their first attempts at reform led to another 20 years of precarious peace within the Roman Republic. But we are now on the, it's rather like a railway train that suddenly switches to another track. We're now on the track that heads towards the total breakdown of the Republic. So that's what I have to say about the beginning of the collapse. And are there any questions emerging from this? Anything at all? <laughs>